Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jane. Actually, in Chinese, is Jie, um, in Chinese order. Um, I am a philosopher by training. Um, today, my topic is why health matters to justice. We talk about a lot of um, social justice in general, and talk about gender justice, racial justice, mostly in the United States. And but here in China, we seldomly talk about health justice. And why is that? My point is that. I think we don't have, we, we still don't have a very clear notion of health justice. So in short, I want to um, specifically focus on this topic, why health matters to justice. But to speak so, it seems quite abstract. Let's take a, a little um, question. Uh, let's start with an imaginary case. Suppose you're expecting a baby. So how would you render these options? Um, I think this is a slide. This is the wrong slide. How, how, would you, how would you choose the options below? So you can only choose one. It's not ranking, OK? Sorry, it's not ranking. It's just you can choose only one. What would you choose? Let me uh, see your hands. So if you want a baby to be born with talents, please raise your hand. OK. That, that, would, be, that would be excluding other options, OK? You can, on, you can only guarantee one. You can only guarantee one. OK. Um, who uh, who opts for um, option B? Oh, okay, this is the lights are too bright. I can see you guys. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of that's a lot. Uh, option C. Nobody really. Nobody. Are we anti-capitalism here? <laughs> okay. Okay, a little bit technical problem. Um, okay, we get it. We made. My students said, always said, okay, we get it, because health is so important. Um, and it's, it's like a cliche, right? But um, my question is rather, why is it distinctively valuable? Or um, why is, furthermore, why is it concerned with justice, um, social justice in general? Uh, this is my work. And, and, and for philosophers, they always turn this question into another way of saying, um, they said, they ask instead, why health is of special moral importance. It's not just important. Why is morally important? I know it's important, right? Everybody knows it's important. For a um, political philosopher and a uh, moral philosopher whose name is John Rawls, maybe you have heard of him. He wrote a book called A Theory of Justice in 1971. Um, he's a Harvard philosopher, of course. And he, he says that in order to fairly distribute our wealth and uh, opportunities, resources, things like that, we have to embed uh, the two principles of justice into the social design, the, the, the institution design. And one of them, most importantly, is the principle called fair equality of opportunities. So remember that that is what invented by John Rawls, which has a lot of influence in, um, in contemporary political philosophy and as uh, in the in the in the real in the reality as well, and re um, regarding health, we have this Harvard uh, philosopher. They are two generations, of course, but they overlapping some, sometimes in Harvard. Norman Daniels he proposes that based on John Rawls' theory of justice, he says that health should be seen as a manifestation as manifestation of equal opportunities. So what does that mean? In short. Quote, he says, we just understand a right to health is a right to a socially just, uh, just distribution of these determinants of health. Sorry for the, um, you cannot see the, the font. Uh, you can see the color of this. It's called determinants of health. So what are these social determinants of health? For uh, philosophers, social scientists, and those public health experts, they do not agree. Uh, they do not disagree on, over this kind of notion called social determinants of health. This includes um, factors such as economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, such as housing, transportation, things like that, and education, of course, and food, nutrition, um, and community and social context. The support you can get from your community. And the last one, of course, you can recognize that is healthcare system. The healthcare system is one of the most important uh, factors in, in, in contributing to health outcome. As you can see, 
you might be aware of that. Does that, does that count already, right? Because healthcare system is so important that if we can get full access and fair access to the medical resources, we should get um, health outcome as fair as possible. Does that, is that enough? So for, for a lot of people, they say that healthcare system is most important. And so they focus their attention on healthcare's healthcare system. But those experts proposing the social determinants of health saying that health is not only determined by healthcare system. It's, just, it's determined by a lot of factors such as those listed here. So try to imagine the case, um, a case always given by the political philosopher Martha Max Baum, who said, she said, there is, imagine, imagine there is a poor little girl living in India, or we might change it, uh, the example a little bit, change to say that maybe this little girl living in rural China, or some, some area in poor, uh, poor country, poor country. And this girl certainly has no so-called economic stability because she has no job. And she has no neighborhood and a physical environment because she um, does not have, have good, good, uh, good transportation and also has no housing, decent housing, and maybe has some safety issues around the neighborhood. And certainly she does not um, receive good education as, as you do, right? <clears throat> Maybe she is a little illiterate. She does not recognize how to read, how to read newspapers, things like that. And she, she does not have good nutrition and food, and she does not have some community support. And what's worse, she cannot get access to the hospitals because it's far too far away, and she does not can, cannot afford that, right? So all of these factors contribute the the outcome that the people who like her as a population, their outcome, health outcome is worse than that other populations. I mean, the population, not just individual. Okay. This is what public health experts would say. So in, in short, we can, we can sort out the logic like this. What Norman Daniels proposes is that if we can design the institution in a way that by incorporating the so-called fair equality of opportunity principle into it, then we can at least guarantee a distribution of the social determinants of health as fair as possible. And in that way, we can have a health outcome as fair as possible. And that's what she, he proposes. But we want us to know why um, does, does his view, does Norman Daniels' his view tell us why health intrinsically matters to justice? Because this is what we care about. We, we want to know. We want to know why health matters to justice, why the society has obligation to deal with the health issue as a central issue in social justice. It seems that Norman Daniels makes this health too instrumental. Why? Because so many things can also be the outcome of a fair distribution of opportunities. Think, of, think about education, think about housing, Think about your um, occupation, your uh, social status, things like that. So it doesn't suffice to show why health intrinsically matters to justice. A lot of scholars then switch to another, uh, another approach called capability approach. Let's see, it's quite straightforward. For a political philosopher, and uh, oh, oh, she's a She's a more philosophy, political philosopher and also um, a feminist scholar. Nasbaum works uh, currently at the University of Chicago. She proposed that in order for one person or for human beings to flourish, one needs to have at least these 10 core capabilities. So they list them here, such as uh, life, bodily health, bodily integrity, senses, imagination, and thought, emotion, and practical reason. And affiliation, so such as the, your relationship you, to your significant others, to your relatives, to your friends, to your to my students maybe, and your relationship with uh, other species, such as dogs and cats and pets. Maybe you can pet um, uh, other things, I, I don't know. And be able to play, 
and the last one be able to control over one's environment. These are all core capabilities. The, these 10 capabilities are all necessary to, for a human being to flourish. So that's necessary. That means that social justice has to take into account these core capabilities. That is quite straightforward. But some, somebody proposed that health is more than that. Health is not just one of the 10 capabilities in this list. Health is more than that. It's more fundamental. Why did it say that? Because as you can see, if I don't have a bodily health, but I, if I don't have full body health, bodily health, I cannot function well with my senses and imagination, right? If I suffer from dementia, if I suffer from a memory loss, I, I have problem with my self-identity. I don't know who I am. I don't know, for example, I, when I go to the bathroom, I, I don't remember where I'm going to. Then I don't have normal emotions and I don't have a normal functioning practical reason. And I cannot have a normal relationship with human beings and maybe with pets, right? So in that way, bodily health functions as more fundamental. So what, it's what they call the mental capability. It's more fundamental. It's underneath this kind of 10 core capabilities. Okay. So let's take a, a, an example to see how the principle of social justice applies to real cases. I, 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 I was asked a lot of times about this question in various um, occasions. How the principle of justice applies to our public health, COVID-19 vaccine allocation. For example, our, uh, our vaccine is limited, or limited, right? So we have to decide who to give or who to give uh, in first place. Actually, in China, we have this kind of document saying that we have a policy. We have a policy. This is from the government, official government website. It says, uh, let me translate this. Maybe most of you do, do not need to translate, but I will translate anyway. It says, <laughs> it says we have to, uh, we will, uh, we will, uh, we will, uh, we will uh, uh, allocate this uh, vaccines according to such order. The first, the first, uh, the first one is key population. Key population refers to, for example, the the, the people who are exposed to the high risk. For example, doctors and nurses, me medical staffs, right? The second is the the, the population, the, the people that will be easily get. Uh, get infected when they go abroad. I don't know why this matters. And, and the third one is the people who maintain the basic functioning of the whole society. And this is what China, China government document says. But as you can see, we cannot see any logic behind this. We, we just see a document saying that we should give this to uh, who and should give this to whom first. But we do not see the logic. The logic behind it should be what we care as philosophers or as ethicists, we care about what is the principle of ethics that behind such policy. Let's see another example. It's given by um, the uh, National Academy of Science and Engineering Medicine in the United States, of course. The second column they gave is a specification of the ethical principles that says what kind of principles should be the priority. And the third column is, is an initial prioritization. It's phase 1A, phase 1B, phase 2. So it ranks all people here as a recommendation, as an actual um, policy uh, rec recommendation. So this third column is actually um, based on the second column, the ethical principles. But weirdly, you cannot see the, uh, the social justice principle on, in the first place. So what is the first principle? I don't. I don't think um, the the people at the back back seats can see this. It's maximum benefit. The first ethical principle they specify, they recommend, is maximum benefit. It's not principle of justice, but the principle just goes to the second place and third place. The second says um, equal concern. The third says mitigation of health inequities. Right. These are all concerned about justice. And let's see another one. It's actually given by Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. The same thing happens here. 
the first principle isn't about justice. It's about maximize benefits and minimize harms. Right? And the second and third are, are concerned about justice. It's uh, mitigate health inequities, promote justice. And let's see another example. It's a recommendation by the professional group called Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. So the first principle is promoting common good. Why is that? We talk a lot about social justice, but none of this put justice first. Because when we're considering this, we are facing a balance between the justice and principle of justice and principle of utilities. Always, when, when we make health-related decisions, the priority doesn't always go to justice. Because justice is one of the core values, one of the core values that contribute to human well-being. And what's more is we are facing with an absolute scarcity in which we have to decide which vaccine who gets vaccinated first. And it's different from a case in which it's a scenario in which there is just a relative scarcity, for example, when we're considering about um, how to allocate resources among people who want to, to get dental care or who want a cosmetic surgery. Well, that's relative scarcity because we can always, um, in the long run, uh, rearrange that, right? But we do not have time in COVID-19 cases because it's a global pandemic, it's urgent. It's emergent. So, but when I'm speaking of this, I'm, I'm not aiming to say that this diminish our claim that health matters to justice. So I have to specifically summarize why health matters to justice. This goes to the last slide of my talk and it's uh, quite theoretical, but I'm trying to explain it as, uh, as simple as possible. Why health matters justice? Philosophers say that we can have a, 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 like several tiers to uh, to 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 uh, sort it out this question. The first one is health matters to justice intrinsically. This one is easy because health health as a uh, uh, is good for fun for functioning for human species in order to be function well as a biological being. We have to be healthy, right? This is simple. So that's not complicated at all. The second is that health can be instrumentally important to justice because as you can see from the previous slides, as Nussbaum says, and those people who uh, revised Nussbaum's account, they said the, the option that the capability of health actually provides access to other core capabilities. It serves as an instrumental uh, capability. And the second tier of the second tier is that it renders freedom to choose among health-related options. What does that mean? So, for example, if somebody is infertile, that means she or he cannot give birth to a child, right? And why is that a health issue? And why is that a, a health justice issue? Because some students say, no, it's not a social justice issue. It's just a health issue. You know, somebody is infertile but he might not be able to, uh, he might decide that he would never want children. He will hate children, right? So it doesn't matter if he's fertile or not. But when philosophers say that, yes, they, they are claiming that, it's, diff it's to decide to not to want kids is one thing. It's another thing to not to have options to choose from. So this is the freedom that gives you the options to choose from. So health is something that we owe to each other. As a society, we owe to each other. The last one. The philosopher's concerns about concern about this kind of fundamental sense of why health matters to justice. It says, because health retains agency for autonomous decisions. What does that mean? What is agency? Agency is what makes you human. As a human beings, you recognize the reason that you choose and to respond to these reasons and to act on based on these reasons. So if you, for example, still, I, I will use that example. If you are suffering from dementia due to uh, Alzheimer's, something like that, then you cannot retain your agency for making any kind of decision, basically any kind of decision in your life. And in that way, you lose your agency. And that what, that's what's fundamental for, um, for being a human. And it is those decisions 
that constitute our life. And that's what I, I'm going to share, uh, I, what I want to share today. And thank you for all for coming. I hope you don't find it too abstract. <laughs> thank you.